Yes, Maharaj, we can. Om Magyana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksurun Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Pracharine Nirvisesha Shunyavadi Paschacha Dejatarine Vanchakaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare so we're continuing our study of uh, Srimad Bhagavatam at the level of Bhakti by Bhav, Bhakti, what's it? <laughs> what do you call it? Bhakti by Bhav? Bhakti by Bhav, Module 2, Maharaj. Module 2. Okay. So, uh, let me see. I've got the text here. We're going to go on to, we covered chapter 15 and 16 in the last class, and we're going to go on tonight, chapter 17. Uh, can, can I be a co-host? Somebody... Yeah, sure, sure, Mars. One minute, Maharaj. Sorry. Yes, Maharaj. Now you have the codes. Okay, thank you. So I can just go to the text. Uh, all right, so this is chapter 17. Uh, we heard about Jambu Dweep. Well, we heard about Bumandala, Bumandala, and in the center of Bumandala is Jambu Dweep, and the center of Jambu Dweep is Mount Meru. Right. So we're going on today, chapter seventeen. We're going to hear about the descent of the river Ganges. Mountains and rivers are very important. We have dweeps and varshas. Dweepas, dweeps and varshas. Dweeps are surrounded by water and varshas are surrounded by mountains. So mountains play a big part in geography. A lot of mountains in Bhumandala, in uh, Jambu Dweep. A lot of mountains. <laughs> All right, so text number one begins, Sukadeva Goswami speaking. And he's talking about how Lord Vamanadev appeared into the sacrificial arena of Bali Maharaj. Of course, Bali Maharaj was leading the Asuras, and they conquered over the demigods, because the demigods had offended Brihaspati. So Brihaspati pulled out and left them on their own, and they, were, they had no power to deal with the, demi, the demons when the demons came. So Bali Maharaj conquered over them, and they took control of the heavenly planets, and the demigods were left to wander with no place of their own. And Mother 
Aditi was grief-stricken because her sons, the demigods, were not there. And so she approached Kashyapa and it, it was arranged. They got a son, Bali. Uh, not that they got a son, but Lord Vamanadeva appeared. And Lord Vamanadeva comes as a dwarf Brahmana. And he comes to Bali Maharaji's sacrificial arena to get his charity. And it's described here in the first verse how he extended his left leg into the universe and pierced a hole in the covering with his big toe, it says here. His big toe went through the covering of the universe. And the result was that you get the water, the pure water of the Kosho Ocean entering into this universe. And this pure water is the Ganges River. So it's described here also the, because the Lord's lotus feet are covered with red powder, reddish kumkum powder, and so the water of the Ganges become, became reddish. And there's actually up there in the Himalayas, you can see there's some part of the, where the Ganges appears, it's actually red. It's got this pinkish color in it from contact with the Lord's lotus feet. So the, the, the water which comes into the universe has washed the feet of Lord, well Lord Brahma actually took the water and he washed the feet, he took some of the water and he took the opportunity to wash the feet of Lord Vamanadev. So it became Vishnu Padi, the water of the Ganges took the name Vishnu Padi. It's also called Patita Pavani because the water of the Ganges can deliver all the fallen souls. The water of the Ganga is very powerful, very purified. We all know, of course, Indian people particularly know about the power of the Ganga. So, Mother Ganga comes into the universe. It goes first to Lord Brahma and then from Lord Brahma then it goes to Dhruvaloka. It says here, after 1000 millenniums, the water of the Ganges descended to Dhruvaloka, which is mm, the topmost planet in the universe. And then all after, after coming to Dhruvaloka, then it goes to the the great sages, the Saptarishis, they're below Dhruvaloka and they're also attracted to get the water of the Ganga on their head and hold the water of the Ganges on their head. So it comes to from Dhruvaloka, goes down to the Saptarishis and then from the Saptarishis then it goes to the moon before it comes onto the top of Mount Meru. So that's the arrangement. So text 2 describes about Dhruva Maharaj, how he's so pious, such a great devotee, so determined to do devotional service. He's described by the word Viravrat, fully determined. Determined, right? Determination. Do you know the verses in Bhagavad Gita where they speak about determination? Not Viravrat, but Diravrat or Dridavrat. Dridavrat, right? Yes, Maharaj. Satatam kirtayantoma yatan tascha dridavrataha. Okay, very good. There's another one also. Uh, Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Yes. yes, right. So, okay, so good. So these two verses describe also determination. Dhruva Maharaj, he is Viravrat, fully determined. 
is firmly fixed in devotional service. He's been residing up there on Dhruvaloka this, for this day of Brahma, anyway, he's been up there. And he's constantly thinking of Lord Krishna in his heart and he's very happy to get the Abhishek water of Lord Vishnu and he holds it also on his head and it experiences great happiness taking the water on his head. So after Dhruvaloka then it comes to the seven rishis, seven Saptarishis, Marichi Vashishta Atri are mentioned, there's others. So they're also devotees and they also know the value of the water of the Ganges and they're happy to take the water of the Ganges on their head. So Prabhupada in the purport talks about two kinds of uh, transcendentalists. There's the, the devotees and there's the impersonalists or the jnanis. So they're both transcendentalists but there's a difference, right? The jnanis or the impersonalists, they want to merge into the Brahman and the devotees, they enjoy spiritual relationships with Lord Krishna. So a big difference. So we don't usually get along together, we don't mix. So from the Saptarishi, we hear, oh, Prabhupada writes in the purport about yogis like Vishwamitra, how he failed in his attempt to control his senses, how he succumbed to Menaka, and as a, as a result Sakuntala was born. So controlling the senses is very important. And devotees, we control our senses by engaging them in devotional service. But the yogis they try to stop the senses. So that's discussed, of course, in the Bhagavad Gita. That it's better to be engaged in activities rather than to try to stop the senses. So the Ganga water comes down, it purifies Druvaloka, it purifies the Saptarishis, and then comes to Chandraloka and then finally reaches Brahma's abode atop Mount Meru. Now oh, I remember we were discussing about Brahma's abode there and there was some question about Brahma's abode on top of Mount Meru. So of course we know Brahma has his own planet, there's Brahma Loka way up at the top of the universe. So <laughs> I was listening to one devotee's commentary on this. He, he described this uh, Brahma's residence on top of Mount Meru. He said it's Brahma's resort. <laughs> Brahma's resort. So the, the, the demigods, they all come there to Mount Meru and the mountains around Mount Meru where there are beautiful gardens. They all come to enjoy there. And it's a place of the pastimes, for the pleasure gardens, for the demigods. They come to enjoy. So, you, of course you say, well, there's, there's already enjoyment there in the higher planets. They have opulence, they have sense gratification. But some special, special facilities are there. Special attractions, the mountains, the gardens, the lakes, the birds, the flowers, everything. Something that's also different from their own place. So the demigods are all attracted, they come there to enjoy. And Lord Brahma, he has also his resort on top of Mount Meru. So the Ganges comes there on top of Mount Meru. Uh, always described, it's carried into the moon by innumerable celestial airplanes. So they have billions of celestial airplanes that carry the Ganga 
they carry it to the moon. And then from the moon it comes down to Mount Meru. And from Mount Meru it comes down. We'll hear about how on, from Mount Meru it actually divides into four. There are four branches. Before, it's not that it goes in the whole of the Ganga, the whole of the water goes straight to Bharatvarsh, but it divides into four branches in different regions. So that's mentioned here, text number six. Text number six. Uh, oh, okay, the first branch is, to, well, yes, yeah, described there. Text number five describes the, how it divides into four. There's a branch north, south, east and west, four branches. And it's known by the name Sita, Alakananda, Chaksu and Bhadra. Right? Alakananda to the south and uh, Chaksu to the north and Sita to the, the, the west and is it to the east or Chaksu to the west, something like this, we'll hear. Sita runs down, flows through Brahmapuri to the peaks of the Kesarachala mountain, which are almost as high as Mount Meru itself, almost as high as Mount Meru. So the, these mountains, of course, are incredibly high, and Mount Meru is also so high, it's just beyond our powers of imagination. We cannot understand it with our limited senses, of course. We have no experience of mountains, the height of what are being talked about, what are being described here in the Srimad Bhagavatam. We, you have to go to another plane to actually see or to experience these kind of mountains. And there are also beings, huge beings. Uh, the hat people, the people like Hanuman, he has a body about the size of the, the British Isles. <laughs> His body is just huge. Because they have mystic powers, they can expand their bodies. So these mountains are just inconceivably high. Not, there's not, we don't have any experience in our own lifetime of such mountains and, because it, it's, it's all in another realm and to enter into that region you have to transcend this earthly planet and enter into a, this, a, the higher realm, a different realm. So the Sita river, the branch Sita flows to the west and then Chaksu flows to the east, it will be, and coming through the different mountains, it's described, it flows right through, down, first of all going down Mount Meru, and then crossing the mountains, the neighboring, whichever mountains are there on the east, the south, the north, the west, and then crossing into the land, whichever particular region of uh, Jumbo Dweep is there, and then flows down into the saltwater ocean. Runs into the saltwater ocean. Now, the Alakananda, Alakananda is flowing to the south. And that's where Bharatvars is. So in order to get to Bharatvars, it has to pass over the tops of mountains and various lands, falls down with fierce force upon the, upon the peaks of the mountains like Hemakuta and Himakuta. After inundating the tops of these mountains, the Ganga falls down onto the tract of land known as Bharatvars, which she also inundates. 
Then the Ganga flows into the ocean of salt water in the south. People who come to bathe in this river are fortunate. It is not very difficult for them to achieve with every step the results of performing great sacrifices like the Rajasuya and Ashwamedha Yagna. So this is the, how the Ganga descends and it's told actually there are two Gangas. There's another Ganga which comes when uh, Sagar Maharaj's sons were all burned to ashes by Lord Kapila. So you may remember, or you may not, I don't know. Anyway, Sagar Maharaj was doing sac horse sacrifices and one horse went missing and he sent, his, he had 60,000 sons, he sent them to go and find the horse. So they couldn't find it. So he, they couldn't find it on Bo Mandala. He told them to dig down, and they dug, they dug down uh, 60,000 yojanas or something into the earth. Each of them dug one yojana, so 60,000 yojanas into the earth. And they couldn't find it. They told them, keep going. They dug, they dug another 10,000 yojanas, then 70,000 yojanas below Bhumandala, they came to Patala Loka and the horse was there beside Lord Kapila. And Lord Kapila was sitting there doing meditation and austerity. And these sons of Saga foolishly thought that Lord Kapila had stolen the horse. And they came towards him in an aggressive mood. And the result was their own anger in their bodies caused their bodies to burn to ashes. It was not that Lord, Nish, Lord Kapila they burned them to ashes with his glance, but they burned their own selves to ashes due to their anger towards Lord Kapila. So the result of their offence was they burned to ashes. So after that, another son of Maharaj Sagar came. Amsum, um, the Amsuman, and he came looking for the horse, he, and he came, he saw Lord Kapila there, and he saw the ashes of his relatives. And so Lord Kapila gave him permission to take the horse, and he asked Lord Kapila about how these relatives of his could be delivered. And Lord Kapila told him, you should bring Mother Ganga down from the heavenly planets, you bring her down here. And by the touch of her water, she can purify the ashes and they can be liberated, they can come back, they can get a, a form again. So Amsuman was, he tried to bring Mother Ganga, he was not successful. And then another one of his, his son tried and then Bhagirat came and Bhagirat did great tapasya, great austerities and he was able to bring Mother Ganga down. So, in the, there's a place up there in the Himalayas where you can see the two Gangas meeting. You can see the one Ganga which is coming from uh, uh, from Bhagirat, due to Maharaj Bhagirat's tapasya, and the other Ganga. And they're different colours and you, you see them both meeting and they merge there, and it's a holy place up there in the Himalayas. Now, it's also mentioned that sometimes the Ganga is invisible. It has that kind of a quality. That sometimes it's visible, sometimes it's not. So, very, very, very special, very sacred water. So we, we're very conscious to always respect Mother Ganga. And Prabhupada writes, he talks about how people in India are so fortunate that they can go and bathe at so many places. They can go to the Prayag for the Kumbha Mela and then they can go to come over to Ganga Sagar 
and go to Kapila Muni's ashram and bathe there. And there are so many holy places along the banks of the Ganga. In fact, they say wherever the Ganga flows, that's a holy place. That makes a holy place. So there was a, the question was raised then, what about Eka Chakra? How is Eka Chakra a holy place? Because there's no Ganga there. So then it's pointed out that because the Pandavas came there, it's a holy place. So not only the Ganges makes a place holy, the presence of the Pandavas, the great saintly persons, they make a place a holy place. So many other rivers, big and small, also flow from the top of Mount Meru. The rivers are like daughters of the mountain. They flow down and so Jambudweep is in nine varshas, right? Nine tracts of land. And one of them is Bharatvars. Which Bharatvars is like a karma stan, a place of work where people earn their karma. The other eight dweeps in Jambudweep, there are nine dweeps in Jambudweep. The other eight dweeps mentioned here, they're for very highly elevated pious persons. After returning from the heavenly planets, they enjoy the remaining results of their pious activities in these eight earthly regions. So we should understand there's different kinds of heaven or what, we, what you say swarga, right? We have Divya Swarga, which is, you know, heavenly planets up there where the demigods reside, the, the, the original place of the demigods, Divya Swarga. And then coming down to Bomandala, you have Boma, Boma Swarga. And then below that, below Boma Mandala, be, below Boma Mandala, you have Bila Swarga. Bila Swarga meaning the subterranean heavenly planets. And there are different reach seven planets below Bhumandala. And we know Bali Maharaj, he's residing there. And these places are very opulent. It's not that they're all hellish because they're b below the region of Bhumandala. But there's no sunlight there. That's the difference. That they have to light the place by means of jewels. And you see some of these species who are living there, the Nagas and so on, they have jewels on their head to illuminate that place. So there's three kinds of heaven, right? You have Swarga up there where the demigods, the original residents. You have Boma Swarga, earthly heavenly region, which is here on Jambadweep, where Jambadweep is, earthly heaven. And then you have Bila Swarga. It's all, all heavenly, it's all dealing with sense gratification. So Bila, heavenly, plant, heavenly places in the lower regions. And then Boma, Boma Swarga Padana, the heavenly places on earth where the eight Varshis other than Bharatvars. Bharatvars is not so heavenly. We know that, right? Bharatvars is where we're coming to get the karma. When we finished up all of our pious activities mentioned here, the very pious elevated persons, after they used up their piety from the heaven, they come, they have a little piety remaining and they go there in Jambadweep, in these different eight varshas which are there which we're going to hear about tonight. So in these heavenly planets, the results of their pious activity, they return to this earth. In this way, they're elevated to the heaven. And so what's happening? They're going up and coming down, going up, coming down. It's like the roller, roller coaster described here. This process is known Brahmanda Brahmana wandering up and down throughout the universe. Those who are intelligent, in other words, will think how to get out 
We won't want to just wander in the material universe. Of course, the, the material opulence is very powerful and very bewildering. We will hear about it tonight, what, what goes on in these eight regions, how, do they, how they enjoy. So Prabhupada writes, a devotee is never caught in the process of being promoted to the heavenly planets and again coming down. Not, in, not interesting for a devotee. Those who are sincerely seeking the favour of Krishna come in contact with a guru, a bona fide representative of Krishna. And then Prabhupada discusses about what it means to be a guru. Who is actually a guru? What did, what's the qualification? Guru must be direct representative of Krishna, who distributes the instructions of Krishna without any change. So that's important. He, he shouldn't, he, Prabhupada always said, don't change anything. But at the same time, it's very difficult. Don't change anything. That, but times are changing and the circumstances are changing, but keep the principles. Don't change the principles. The details may vary, but don't change the principles. So then Prabhupada talks about who's qualified to be a guru. He says somebody may be a brahmana, he may have all the qualities of a brahmana, but if he's not a devotee of Krishna, he should not become a guru. Prabhupada, all, you must be a guru. You must, if you're going to be a guru, you must represent Krishna. He doesn't see any other quality, no other kind of guru. Uh, Prabhupada also talks about the different qualifications of the brahmana, the occupations, what they're supposed to do, right? Mm. Patan, patan, yajan, yajan, dan, pratigraha, right? The six activities of the brahmana. And studying the scriptures and teaching the scriptures, worshipping the deity and teaching others to worship the deity. And then also accepting charity and giving charity. So, uh, there's a, is it uh, one of the uh, followers of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he's written that in the Kali Yuga, the brahmanas are expert at only one of these six activities. The only thing they're expert at is accepting charity, to receive alms from others, pratigraha. The other things they don't worry about. They don't give charity, they don't study, they don't worship, no, they don't teach anything. They just come and get, give me charity, I'm a brahmana. <laughs> so that's the Kali Yuga brahmana, expert at taking charity, never give anything. So they should be a devotee of Krishna, that's important, that's a qualification. Okay, so those, Prabhupada writes at the end of the purport, those who fully engage in devotional service to Krishna just to please him are not interested in the three divisions of heavenly places, namely Divya Swarga, Boma Swarga and Bila Swarga. Now, Sukadeva Goswami is going to go on and tell us about the life in these eight different varshas which are there around Jambudweep, right? The different tracts of land. And he explains here, text number 12 describes, uh, human beings live 10,000 years according to earthly calculations. All the inhabitants are almost like demigods. They have the bodily strength of 10,000 elephants. Indeed, their bodies are as strong as thunderbolts. The youthful duration of their lives is very pleasing and both men and women enjoy sexual union with great pleasure for a long time. After years of sensual pleasure, 
When a balance of one year of life remains, the wife conceives a child. Thus, the standard of pleasure for the residents of these heavenly regions is exactly like that of human beings who live during Treta Yuga. <laughs> Treta Yuga, first of all, you, we should understand that in these regions there is no Treta Yuga and there's no Kali Yuga. Satya Yuga, Treta Yuga, Kali Yuga, Dwapara Yuga, that's only in the Bharatvarsh region, in that one region, Bharatvarsh. The other regions, they don't have these four, these four ages. So, they live for 10,000 years, they have the same duration of life, there's no, like it, not like on our planet, you know, Kali Yuga, short life, Satya Yuga, long life, live, what, a hundred thousand years, and then Treta Yuga, ten thousand years, Dwapara Yuga, one thousand years, Kali Yuga, one hundred years. So, it's mentioned here about, uh, it's, it, life is, the residents of the heavenly planets enjoy just like in Treta Yuga. The standard of pleasure is like that Treta Yuga. In Satya Yuga, the standard was simply meditation. Everyone was engaged in meditation. And then Treta Yuga, this, the, 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 what happens in Treta Yuga is people just enjoy. They're, they're very happy. The, the nature of the life in Treta Yuga is happiness. But with Dwapara Yuga, misery starts to come. The suffering starts to come. And that suffering becomes more and more prominent in Kali Yuga. So this is pointed out here, that these residents in the eight Varshas, their standard of enjoyment is like what's going on in Treta Yuga here in this region. Happiness. They're enjoying happiness. And their happiness is described. They have these big strong bodies and they have beautiful women and they're, and they're only getting pregnant one year before the end of life. So, sense gratification. It's all sensual pleasure. Okay. Prabhupada writes about the Treta Yuga, sense, sense pleasure. In, during Treta Yuga, people enjoyed sense pleasure without tribulation. Material miseries began in Dwapara Yuga, but not very stringent. Stringent material miseries really began for, from the advent of Kali Yuga. And then Prabhupada discusses about pregnancy and he says that pregnancy takes place only in lower grade life. And then he even talks about in the spiritual world, people are not very attracted to sex life. And people would often ask Prabhupada about that. Is there sex in the spiritual world? So Prabhupada deals with it here. He said, people are not very attracted to sex life due to their exalted devotional attitude. Practically speaking, there is no sex life in the spiritual world. But even if sometimes it does occur, there is no pregnancy at all. <laughs> well, of course, you couldn't have pregnancy in the spiritual world, right? spiritual bodies. But then Prabhupada talks about what happens on planet Earth. They said people are killing the child. People, people they, they do things like abortion, they kill the child in the womb. And Prabhupada said this is the most degraded practice. It can only perpetrate the miserable material conditions of those who perform it. So, this is Kali Yuga, such a hellish situation. And it's so common, we see all over the world, America, 
China, India. They are everywhere it's going on. People used to like children. Nowadays you have two children and think, oh, how do you manage so many children? People used to have eight, ten children and think nothing of it. But Prabhupada does also say that pregnancy is for the lower species of life. Prabhupada thought one child was enough. He told devotees, you know, one child, you have one child, that's enough, you don't need to have a lot of children. You get it, you have your child, and then, then you can devote yourself more to Krishna consciousness. All right, so then, so Gadeva Goswami then goes on to describe life in, that, in these eight varshas, and we, we, he talks about all the different flowers, and the fruits, and the different trees, and hermitages are also there, and then there's mountains and lakes with clear water, full with lotus flowers, and different birds like swans, and ducks, and cranes, the fragrance of the lotus flowers, and the sound of bumblebees, and this is, this is Swarga, this is the heaven, earthly heaven, heaven on earth. Just like in our Mumbai center, they call it heaven on earth. So here, this is Bomaswarga, heaven on earth. <laughs> so Prabhupada, oh, Sukadeva Goswami said, in this pleasing situation, the wives of the demigods smile playfully at their husbands and look upon them with lusty desires. All the demigods and their wives are constantly supplied with sandalwood pulp and flower garlands by their servants. In this way, all the residents of the eight heavenly varshas enjoy, attracted by the activities of the opposite sex. A material comparison on our own planet would be something like going to Hawaii. In Hawaii, on Hawaii, you know, they have a lot of flowers and a lot of fruits and things, very good climate. Even if it rains, it's not cold. You know, you go to Europe, when it rains, it's so cold and miserable. But in Hawaii, it rains, but still it's warm. And the, the sun's always shining, like, so people uh, enjoy. So, this is where the demigods enjoy, this place here. What we're hearing about here is where the demigods come to enjoy, or people who have used up their piety in heaven, they come down to this place. Okay, in the heavenly planets, however, O Prabhupada talks about the difference between heavenly enjoyment, the, uh, how people on this planet, when we get sense gratification, when we enjoy, we totally forget about Krishna. We're just totally into the body. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, but in, in the heavenly planets, however, although the residents enjoy superior sense gratification, they never forget their position as eternal servants of the Supreme Being. So this is a, a very big difference. Just like, remember when you studied the, the third canto, you had Kardama Muni and Devahuti, and how they were going up to the heavenly planets and they were enjoying so much sense gratification. So, they also never forgot the Supreme Lord. That's the difference. You see that these elevated beings, that they can have sense gratification, but they don't forget their relationship with the Lord. Totally the opposite on this planet. People become so degraded. In fact, we're warned 
to be careful about material opulence on this planet. Okay, text 14, to show mercy to his devotees in each of these nine tracts of land, the Supreme Personality of Godhead expands himself in his quadruple expansions. Vasudev Sankarshan Prajumna Nani Ruda. In this way he remains near his devotees to accept their service. And then Prabhupada talks about how we are not able to serve the Lord directly ourselves, but we can serve the deity. We don't have the Lord personally present, but we have the Lord's incarnation in the form of the deity, the Archa Vigraha. The Lord appears in the form of the deity. So the deity is not different from the Lord. And one who is worshipping the deity, he should understand that he's directly associating with the Supreme Lord. Okay, we'll go ahead. Uh, so then Sukadeva Goswami then goes on to speak about the first track of these nine regions. The first one he's speaking about is Ilavrita Varsh, where the only male is Lord Shiva, the most powerful demigod. And Lord Shiva, of course, is not alone, he's with his wife, Goddess Durga. And not only is Goddess Durga there, but there are also, how many billion of uh, maidservants are there? Any foolish man dares to enter that land, she immediately turns him into a woman. I don't know if it, she does it, but Lord Shiva does it. It happened that uh, Lord Shiva was enjoying with his wife on one occasion, when some great sages entered in, and they entered into this region of Ilavritavarsh, which and Kailash is actually there. You remember we were speaking about Kailash, the mountain of Kailash is actually there in this region of Ilavritavarsh. So the people, some sages came in where Lord Shiva was enjoying with his wife Bhavani, and she was embarrassed to see herself, you know, not properly dressed in, in front of uh, so many great sages. So Lord Shiva understood the situation and he gave a proclamation that anybody comes into that region where Lord Shiva is with his wife, that they would be transformed into a woman because he didn't want any other men coming in there to see his wife. So mentioned here, Lord Shiva encircled by 10 billion maidservants of Goddess Durga who minister to him. How would you like that? 10 billion maidservants. I wonder how he manages to take care of them, huh? Interesting. All right, so Lord Shiva, of course, he is always worshipping Sankarshan. Um, so we will hear about Lord Shiva and how he, he Lord Shiva actually comes. In. The original cause of Lord Shiva is Sankarshan. And so Lord Shiva is always worshipping Sankarshan. He's always meditating upon him. And we're told the mantra which he uses to chant also. So Lord Shiva we think of Lord Shiva, uh, he's a guna avatar. He's, he's not in the mode of ignorance, but he's in charge. He oversees the mode of ignorance. It's mentioned here, just like Sankarshan and Lord Shiva, they're called tamasi, because their responsibility, they do the work of destruction, and they do the work of also uh, overseeing the mode of ignorance. They're not in the mode of ignorance, they're transcendental, but they have to oversee the affairs of these particular, of that mode, and they oversee the work of destruction. So, Lord Sankarshan is always 
in trance, we, if we want to, uh, Lord, Lord Sankarshan is in charge of the false ego. So if we have, want to get free of our false ego, we should worship Lord Shiva. Who med as, and we should worship him as he meditates on Lord Sankarshan. Lord Sankarshan is his worshipful Lord. And it's said the snakes which are on the body of Lord Shiva, they represent Lord Sankarshan. So Lord Shiva offers wonderful prayers. That's the, the rest of the chapter where we can, we can see the prayers which Lord Shiva offers to Lord Sankarshan. He, he, uh, he, he says, uh, you deliver your devotees from the clutches of material existence. Non-devotees, however, remain entangled in material existence by your will. Kindly accept me as your servitor. And then he, Lord Shiva goes on, he says, we cannot control the force of our anger. Anger management, a big issue. So many devotees, they have a lot of problem controlling anger. So, mentioned here, when we look at material things, we cannot avoid feeling attraction or repulsion for them. But the Supreme Lord is never affected in this way. Although he glances over the world, for the purpose of creating, maintaining and destroying, he's not affected, even to the slightest degree. The one who desires to conquer the force of the senses must take shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord. Then he will be successful. So Lord Sankarshan is the first expansion. Uh, the exp from Krishna comes Balaram, from Balaram comes Sankarshan. And then from Sankarshan we get Mahavishnu, and from Mahavishnu comes uh, Garbhodakshaya Vishnu, and from Garbhodakshaya Vishnu Lord Brahma takes birth, and from Brahma Lord Shiva takes birth. So this is the, the, the process of creation. This is still the, the prayers of Lord Shiva. Anyone who remains unagitated, even in the presence of cause of agitation, is called dira or equipoised. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, being always in a transcendental position, is never agitated by anything. Therefore, someone who wants to become dira must take shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord. And then Prabhupada quotes 2.13, Dhiras Tatra Namuyati. Right, become sober-minded, be sober about changing the body. And Prabhupada gives Prahlad as an example of a dira. So many disturbing situations Prahlad was in, but he, he remained unagitated, always calm and quiet. Even Lord Brahma was frightened. So dira, we have to become dira. Prabhupada sometimes translates dira as sober, undisturbed. So Lord Shiva is glorifying uh, Sankarshan and describes the great power of Sankarshan how the Lord in his incarnation as Shesha holds all the universes on his hoods. Each universe feels no heavier than a mustard seed to him. So all the universes are like just like a mustard seed on the head of Ananta Shesha. Lord Ananta Shesha supports all the universes. We would think the universe is so heavy, but for him it's just like a mustard seed. 
So this is the this greatness of the Supreme Lord. Here's the summary of the creation which I had just given you, right? From, Maha, from Sankarshan, Mahavishnu expands, Mahavishnu, then Garbhodakshai Vishnu, then Lord Brahma this comes from the lotus flower, from the navel of Garbhodakshai Vishnu, and then Brahma fathers Lord Shiva, from whom all the other demigods gradually evolve. So like that, creation is explained. Okay, so Lord Shiva is glorifying the position of Lord Sankarshan and it describes about the illusory energy, how it conditions people to the material world. And Lord Shiva says, persons like us cannot understand how to get out of that illusory energy. So that is a fact. On our own, we can never get free of the illusory energy. So Prabhupada quotes a verse that we have to surrender, 714, that we have to surrender to Krishna, then only we can become free from the material energy only by taking shelter of Lord Krishna. Nature is nothing but a machine operated by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. When one understands the operator, his problems of life are solved. very uh, clear and poignant statement by Srila Prabhupada there, that the problems of life are solved when we understand the operator. The operator, of course, being Lord Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So when we can understand Him, then all the problems of life are solved. Okay, that's chapter 17. Are there any questions? Before we go on, anyone? Oh, Maharaj, I have a question. Yes, Prabhu. Um, you said that the demigods, they uh, I mean, like the the people that come down from the uh, heavenly, three, like the higher heavenly planes down to the earthly heavenly planes, they're uh, experiencing all this sensual enjoyment and all this, uh, what do you call, just sense gratification in general, but they still remember Krishna. Isn't that like their goal of life? So then what, uh, aren't they in a better situation than us? So then why do they, why, do, why can't they achieve liberation from there if they're always thinking of Krishna? because they're also attached to their sense gratification. See? It's not that they're only thinking of Krishna in, in pure devotion, but they're also attached to their sense gratification. Okay, thank you. That's a problem. They want Krishna, but they also want the sense gratification. Yeah, they're you know, they're pious people. We see it, we see it a lot. There's a lot of people like that, a lot of people. They're pious, you know, they're devotees, but they want their sense gratification also. They're not going to give up their sense gratification. It's a very common scenario. We get a lot of people, a lot of the, our devotees are like that. How much are we going to give up? You know, how much can we give up? We, Prabhupada even said, we ne everybody has to have some sense gratification, you have to have some salt in the food. No salt, no taste. 
So these people, they, they're, 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 somehow they've got a karma which gives them that particular kind of sense gratification. Of course, you have to understand they're coming down from the higher planets. We're told that they've used up their piety in the higher planets. So the higher planets, there's also a lot of sense gratification there. And so they could get, they could get quite a taste for sense gratification. We know Indra has a lot of trouble there. Being surrounded by opulence and beautiful, the, the, the beauty of the opposite sex, and then they're given these strong bodies, big strong bodies with the strength you know, of 10,000 elephants and a long life, 10,000 years. You know, we have, we have a very short life, and we have very short lives, and we have very w limited bodily strength. So certainly they're, they're going to want to, you know, you have a big strong body, people want to enjoy sense gratification. They will need sense gratification. They can't live without it practically. But for devotees, of course, for people who are in the path of devotion, then it's different. You see, these people are thinking, they're conscious of the Lord, but they don't, it's not like, you know, pure devotion, you know. They have some bhakti, they have some devotion, they know about the Lord, they have some devotion. But, Prabhupada's pointing out how people in, on this planet have become totally bewildered, totally degraded by sense gratification. And they lose all their piety. And that's why he talks about how, you know, people do things like abortions. They have these abortions, the, the women will go for the abortion and kill the child. And you get women, they've had many abortions. It's not just once they go for the abortion. They've had many abortions. You get women coming, oh, oh yeah, I had three abortions. Some women even eight, nine abortions. Of course, it's, it's a very, very heavy thing to do and the body suffers. Okay, that's my comments on it. Thank you, Maharaj. Okay, any no other questions? We'll go ahead. We're going Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. This is Rasika Nanda. I have one doubt, Maharaj, about uh, Ganges uh, coming now to the air. Earlier, I heard that. Uh, Based on the penance of uh, Bhagiratha Maharaj, uh, Ganges uh, came down and it fell on the head of uh, Lord Shiva and from there it came down. Uh, can you please clarify on this Maharaj? Yes, uh, that's uh, when it comes down on the earth planet. To bring it down onto the earth planet, then it had to come onto the head of Lord Shiva. Right? It's coming down from... Uh, Mount Mir, oh, Mount Mir. Well, we said, no, I remember there were, there were, how does it work now? There's two Gangas, the one, the one that was described here, but then Bhagirat also, you see, there's two Gangas, and I talked, I told you about how they meet. There's a place there in the Himalayas where the two parts of the Ganga meet. One was originally, it's the Alakananga, Alakananda. And then the one which is brought by Bhagirat. So when when the after Bhagirat did his tapasya, then the Alakananga became known as also Bhagirati or Janavi or Ganga. So it's like that. The one brought down by Bhagirat, I said there were two gan two parts to the Ganges, and they joined up there in the Himalayas. And the place there, I saw a photograph of it. 
It's a place there in the Himalayas, right there. You can see the two rivers, the two waters meeting. They're different colors. The water from the... Huh? That is Devi Prayag Maharaj. Yeah, right. Deva you, Prayag. Deva Prayag, that's right. Have you been up there, Madhiji? Did you go there? Yes, Prabhu. Yes, yes Maharaj. With Prayat Kadamada Yatra, we had been to Chadam, so we visited Devi. Oh, you're so fortunate. Wonderful, Thank you. wonderful. Thank you. So Deva Prayag, Thank right? Is it Deva Prayag Prabhu? Marriage is seen it. So that's... What Thank I'm you, Manaraj. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. I, I should have... You know, it's a good point. You know, I make it clear. Yeah, that's the difference. So... Bhagirat brought it down on the head of the Lord Shiva. Okay, so we'll go ahead then, chapter 18, and we're going to read all these prayers. Um, I thought what we might do is divide it up. You know, how many people do we have here? How many people are in the class? Maharaj, we have 45. Oh my goodness. But 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 I, as I mentioned, you know, like uh, the Bhakti Vaibhav students are 18, 18. Okay. Uh -huh. So what I thought we could do, I thought I, you know, I, we could put the 18 students into the into groups and give them each a, one of the tracts of land, and then they could give us a summary of what's happening, what the prayers are, and what's taking place in each of the, in their particular tract of land. I thought if we divide it up, it would make it easier. But then if I just, if I just go through it one by one, I thought it would be more interesting for you. We'll give you a tract of land and you can describe it for yourself, right? Because 18 people, right? And we have nine tracks of we have nine tracks of land, in, including Bharatvars. Of course, we're not going to do Bharatvars today. In fact, we won't even do uh, we won't do the tract of land where Lord Rama is worshipped, which is uh, Lord Rama is worshipped in Kimparusha, right? Kimparusha Varsh, where all the monkeys are living. Yes, Maharaj, we can do that. You know, we, we will divide into eight uh, groups. Yes. Two in uh, each and uh, they can discuss and they can share with the class, Maharaj. Right. Class. Okay. So, you you put the, the devotees into groups? Uh, yes, Maharaj. I'll, I'll create uh, breakout rooms. And the first... I'll put them. And yes. group number one, who we'll do this first one? You have to tell us, you know, what is the... What are the prayers about and what's happening there? Who's offering the prayers? The first tract of land is called Badrasrava, Badraswa, Badraswa Varsha. And then the second one, group two, will be Hari Varsha. And then group three, Ketumala. Group four, Ramyaka Varsh. Group five, Hiranmaya Varsh. Group 6, Uttarakuru Varsh. Group 7, Kimparusha Varsh. Well, I, I did one. I already did Ilavrita Varsh. So, <laughs> so Ilavrita Varsh is done. Bharat Varsh we're not going to do. So we're left with seven. So we, we, have, we should have seven groups. Is that okay, Prabhu? Uh, yes, Maharaj, I'll create seven, group, seven groups, Maharaj. And the, the group doing Kim Purusha Bash, that's in the next chapter. It's not in this chapter, it's in the next chapter. So that's group number seven. And you have to do it quite quickly. We'll give you ten minutes. So we want, we just want the main points from the prayers and just a little background if you know anything about who's offering the prayers and what's, who are they, 
that would be nice. So group one, Badrasva Varsh. Group two, Hari Varsh. Group three, Ketu Mala. Group four, Ramyaka. Group five, Hiran Maya. Group six, Uttanakuru. And group seven, Kimparusha Varsh. Hare Krishna Maharaj, I believe that the breakout room's time limit has not been set properly, so within 10 seconds we are back. So, <laughs> I think uh, that requires to be properly set by... <laughs> also... Yeah, yeah. yeah, Prabhu, no, other groups were not created, so I, I put it back. Just be... Uh, uh, just I'm creating again. Just hold for a second. Okay. In this case, Prabhuji, in the, instead of room number, there you please also put which version we are discussing, so that we are clear. We were, we were not very clear about that. Uh, okay. Well, I, t I, I gave the numbers. Group one. Group one was Badrasva Varsh. Group two, Hari Varsh. Group three, Ketumala. Group four, Ramyaka. Group five, Haranmaya. Group six, Uttarakuru. And finally, group seven, Kim Purushavarsh. And to get Kim Purushavarsh, you have to go to the next chapter. So they're in order as you go through the chapter. Like Badravarsh is of the first six verses. Badrashpavarsh, first six. And then Prahlad Maharaj's prayers to Lord Nasringadev after that.
I think we could close the groups now, Prabhu. Uh, okay, Maharaj. We'll give them one more minute, Maharaj. And then, uh... Yeah, okay. Uh, Maharaj, everybody is back, back to the main room now. Okay, so who's, uh, who's the leader, spokesman for group number one? We just like you to summarize for us something from the message of Badrashva. Hare Krishna Maharaj, I'm Revati Gopi speaking Maharaj. Yeah, this is about Badrashva. In Badrashva, actually the son of Dharmaraj, Badrashva is the leader of this uh, group and uh, he is uh, ruling the tract land known as Badrashava Varsha. Along with his uh, associate, he is praying the Lord uh, plenary expert of Vasudeva known as Hayashisha. And uh, Hayashisha is very dear to devotees and he is a director of all religious principles. And, uh, and further he is telling uh, uh, Lord that uh, conditioned souls, they are forgetting the real uh, uh, position of them and they are enjoying their life and wasting their time. So he is praying for their benefit and he is telling you, he addresses that this is last foolish my materialist and uh, here he is asking that uh, sometimes even learned Vedic scholars also because of lost uh, illusory energy 
they are getting bewildered and this is one of the leela of the lot he is taken and he is telling uh, your illusory leelas are very wonderful to know and he is offering uh, his obeisances and uh, even though lord is a creator of maintenance creation and annihilation but he is not uh, attached to them lord is uh, uh, principle of everything at the same time he is separate from everything and his uh, energies are inconceivable and everything is happening because of this lord's inconceivable energy radha madhav can you continue the last one sorry what was that last i i was telling radha madhav madhav tell the last point but... okay hari krishna maharaj hari krishna in the last verse uh, that is the sixth verse um uh in uh, the la i mean uh, the ignorant personified assumed the uh, form of the demon and stole all the vedas and took them to the planet of rasatala and the supreme lord in the form of hayagriva retrieved the vedas and returned to brahma and for that supreme lord they are offering the respectful obeisances hari krishna just i want to one add one thing here he said that they offered the prayers with careful pronunciation i don't know that pronunciation importance also given in this prayers maras hari krishna and by praying the lord our uh, uh, hearts will be cleansed hari can you tell me something about who is higher shirsha and or and who is higher griva do you know anything about them Hare Hare Krishna. According to my understanding, uh, Hare Krishna is a uh, in this gym, uh, in Batra Varsha, the Lord's expansion, which is known as Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna is the Lord, one of the uh, avatara. If you can say, uh, then he he was in the form of past stated, and he went and he saved the Veda from the Madhukaita Padimam. As I remember, if I'm wrong, please correct me. Hayagriva is a form of a horse, huh? Yes, horse. That's why generally we'll read that Hayagriva Sutti, but the knowledge. Okay, and but Hayashirsha, you say, is the expansion of said here the plenary expansion of Vasudeva. Yeah, and every 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 uh, varsha they are praying or one preceding lord like that in uh, this uh, bhadra shava varsha lord is uh, known uh, worshiped as aishesha not something not a name i'm very familiar with that. maybe i have to do some research on that and find out yeah, more this is given in text 1 maharaj of this chapter yes i know but uh, i'm just trying to understand more about the form what does the actual make the, the form of the lord as higher shirsha how does he appear thank you maharaj thank you So Prabhupada did talk about, as you brought up, about the 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 problem that even one may be quite advanced philosophically or quite may have quite a lot of knowledge, but still he can become uh, inattentive, even though he may be in the transcendental position, he may become inattentive. liberated souls he says sometimes become captivated by maya due to inattention even though they're in the transcendental position so the prabhupada is like warning us that how dangerous it is nobody should think of himself as a liberated person we should always be very cautious Prabhupada would always say himself he said I'm always praying to Krishna he said I'm always praying to Krishna please don't let me fall down 
So, of course, I don't know if Prabhupada was actually praying like that, but he said like that to us, so he was warning us how conscious, how careful we have to be, because maya is so powerful. So even one can be in, a, in an advanced position, but it can fall down. And in this section also there's some discussion about uh, why does Krishna allow us to do sinful activities? Would you like to comment on this, Manaji? Why, why does Krishna allow us to do sinful activities? Why does he allow us to get, become liberated and then we become inattentive and we and get problems? Maharaj, uh, actually Krishna doesn't uh, allow anybody to do sinful activities. But when the conditional souls are not listening, are very adamant and they continue doing it, uh, then Krishna allows them to continue doing the sinful activities. So we just have to be persistent, right? If we want to do something which is not proper. Yeah, he gives them and tells them that is wrong, but still they keep continuing, then he lets them do that uh, activity. So Krishna is so kind? Yes, Maharaj. Is, is it kindness that he allows us to do sinful? Shouldn't he be more merciful to us? Shouldn't he stop us from doing sins? He doesn't stop it, he doesn't allow it. Krishna is very kind. Maharaj, I feel that the greater independence which he gave us, he don't want to take away that independence. So sometimes, even though we are doing mistakes, Lord will, uh, through you, through you, us, he'll tell us this is not correct, but still we are doing because of that independence which Lord gave us. It's nothing we are not using properly. We are misusing it. Hmm. And so maybe, yeah, we need to have some... We English. will pay. Guru Maharaj, I yeah. think so, free will it is called. Free will. It gives us free will. Maharaj, yes. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Yes. He also, he also stops us, Maharaj, but we have to listen to him. When, as the Chaitya Guru, he, he tells us, please don't do it. But we don't, we don't listen to him, we ignore him. And then he says, you take the responsibility of this karma. Okay, that's a good point, that, he, that he, he will give us the freedom, but we have to also take the reactions from it. Yes, Lord. Yeah, that you, you do it, you go ahead, you do what you, but you, you will get the reactions and you're responsible. And Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, I'm not responsible for the sinful or pious activities. The people themselves are responsible. In Bhagavad Gita, also third chapter, Krishna, Arjuna is asking, why are we impelled to sinful activities, even unwilling, as if engaged by force? And Lord Krishna said, this is due to lust. So, it, we could say that because of the lust in the heart, the living entity desires, desires to act sinfully. The mercy of the Lord is to let us suffer. Just like Prabhupada said, when he was a child, the, it, there was a fan. And so he wanted to touch the fan. And so his father was saying, no, no, don't touch it. But he, he wanted to touch, so his father said, all right, go ahead, go ahead, put your hand in. So he put his hand a little near it and he got hot and then he pulled his hand back. And then he didn't want to do it anymore. Once he got hit, once he hurt his hand a little bit, he didn't want to do it anymore. And his father said, go ahead, put your hand in. And, and Abhay Prabhupada said, no, 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 I don't want to. <laughs> so sometimes like that. You have to get hit, you have to learn, we would call it going through the school of hard knocks. You get a hard knock, then you're more careful next time. 
So the same way you do some sin, you get punished. You, you won't do it again. You learn, you have to, sometimes we learn by our mistakes. So we could say Krishna allows us, he's, it's a, t a learning program that he gives us that chance. Sometimes we have to learn the hard way. Those people who are more intelligent, of course, they will learn simply by hearing. Other people, they have to suffer. All right, thank you very much, ladies, for this contribution. Let's hear from the next group who were doing uh, Hari Varsa. Hare Krishna Pranams Maharaj, Ram Krishna Das here with uh, Om Govinda Prabhu. So, we were fortunate that we were allotted Hari Varsha. We are located south of Mount Meru, just below the Bhattarasrava Varsha, and uh, below us is the Kim Purusha Varsha, and below that is the Bharata Varsha. That's our geographical location. And we are very happy that uh, on this land of Hari Varsha, we are led by Sri Prahalad Maharaj the topmost devotee of Lord Narsimhadev and the deity that is worshipped here is Sri Narsimhadev, Kesha Vadrita Narahari Rupa, Jai Jagdi Shahari. Prabhupada mentions this in his purport and uh, speaks that Keshava is Sri Hari, is being addressed as uh, Narsimhadev and uh, the verses that cover this uh, section is from 18, uh, 5th canto, 18th chapter, 7th verse till 14th verse, it's about 8 verses. And uh, Sukadeva Goswami narrates that more about Narsingadev and the Hari Varsha uh, and Pralad Maharaj specifically about, he would be speaking in the seventh canto. So that was a little introduction of this. And the rest of the uh, address is all about the prayers which Pralad Maharaj is uh, offering to Lord Narsingadev. And he's also concluding it by saying to all his demoniac family members and friends, saying that one should completely surrender at the lotus feet of. Lord Narsimhadev. And uh, he also addresses uh, that uh, <clears throat> it's only through Bhakti Yoga that one can actually become pacified and become free from the contamination that exists in the material world. And therefore, he invites everyone to engage in the service of the Supreme Transcendence. Verse number 10 very specifically speak, speaks about the content of the prayer, which says, My dear Lord, we pray that we may never feel attraction for the family life consisting of home, wife, children, friends, bank balance, and so on. And he says, a person who's actually self-realized and who has controlled his mind is perfectly satisfied with their necessities of life. And that can happen only when one is situated in Krishna consciousness. And verse number 11 speaks about the glory of Lord Mukunda, that the one who can actually offer one liberation, and says that simply by hearing of them, immediately one associates with the Lord, for a person who constantly and very eagerly hears narrations of the Lord's powerful activities, the absolute truth, the personality of Godhead, in the form of soul vibrations, enters within the heart and cleanses all contamination. And in verse number 12, he speaks of uh, what happens to a person when one engages in such a service, he becomes immediately realized in terms of religion, knowledge and renunciation, and all godly qualities become manifested. And uh, he also compares, he also says that because of the powerful mercy of Lord Vasudeva, but whereas one who may be engaged so perfectly in his uh, material activities, there is no good qualities in him and there is no success for him in his life. And however perfect he may be performing his duties. And verse number 13 speaks of uh, how a person, that, like uh, it's very natural instinct that the fish, the aquatics live in water. Similarly, the devotees live in the shelter of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and thereby uh, not being attached to that position of natural attraction to the Lord is actually a great loss and it's only like a foolish young couple who are attached to each other and bereft of all the spiritual qualities. And in the 14th verse he concludes by saying that simply take the shelter of the lotus feet of Lord Nashingade, which are the actual shelter of fearlessness. And thereby, what is that we can defeat? The indefatigable desires such as moroseness, anger, despair, fear, fear, desire, and false prestige, all of which result in the repetition of birth and death. So these are the glories of Prahlad Maharaj in his service to Lord Narsingadev from Hari Varsha. This is Ramakrishna Das with Om Govinda Prabhu. Hari Om. Thank you, Prabhu. Very nice. So, 
just to go over again some of the points. Uh, yes, uh, there's some very wonderful verses in this section, a couple of very wonderful verses, particularly the first verse, number eight, which is often recited. All right, Om Namo Bhagavate Narasimhaya Namaste Jaste Jaseya Virabir Baba, like that. Lord uh, Prahlad Maharaj is offering prayers to Lord Nishringadev. Kindly vanquish my demonic-like desires for fruitive activities. Please appear in my heart, drive away my ignorance. And at the end of the purport, Prabhupada writes, any devotee aspiring to be free of material desires should offer his respectful prayers to Nishringadev as Prahlad Maharaj did in this verse. So this is really a, a, a very important verse for all of us because certainly we all have material desires and this will help us to get free of these material desires. So Prahlad Maharaj is showing us how to pray to Lord Nishringadev. Lord Nishringadev is Vidya Vinaya. Nasinga, right? He's a destroyer of the obstacles on the path of devotion. So uh, we have to we have to pray to Lord Nasringadev, and Prahlad Maharaj is giving us these nice prayers to offer to the Lord. And then text number nine. Prahlad is talking about, well, Prabhupada picks up on the point about how material world people are very envious, um, but we, if we pray to Lord Nishringadev to sit in our hearts, and Prabhupada quotes, Bahir Nishringo, Ridaye Nishringo, Lord Nishringadev is in our heart, then that will clean our heart so that we can worship the Lord and bring peace to the world get rid of all the bad qualities, the envy, the bad feelings towards others, Lord Nisringadev will remove all, all of these things if we bring Lord Nisringadev to sit in our hearts. Uh, and Prabhupada, the, 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 Prabhupada also discusses about the importance of prayer and how, how a devotee should pray. Praying, of course, is one of the items, of nine angas of devotional service. A Prahlad Maharaj, he's expert in remembering, but at the same time he also shows us how to pray. The first desire, Prabhupada said, he said, the first desire expressed in his prayer is swasti astu vishvasya. Let there be good fortune throughout the entire universe. So Prahlad Maharaj requests the Lord to be merciful to everyone, even his nasty old father. <laughs> so devotees, we want to follow in the mood of Prahlad Maharaj, having that feeling, compassion, concern for others. Prabhupada's mood and mission is described in the purport, that is text number nine. If the Krishna consciousness movement spreads all over the world, and if by the grace of Krishna everyone accepts it, the thinking of envious people will change. Everyone will think of the welfare of others. Hmm? So that is devotee. You're thinking about others. We're not just, we're not thinking about, we're thinking about others. Prahlad Maharaj has that mood. Mm. And then text number 10, Prahlad Maharaj is speaking about what it means to be self-realized. And he talks about accepting the bare necessities of life does not try to gratify his senses. Such a person quickly advances in Krishna consciousness. Right? We want to advance quickly in Krishna consciousness, 
this is how to do it. Be satisfied with the bare necessities of life. In the purport, Prabhupada writes about eating. He says, devotees should eat as simply as possible. Otherwise, attachment for material things will gradually increase and the senses will require more and more material enjoyment. Then the real business of life to advance in Krishna consciousness will stop. So eating, very important part of our devotional service. And Prabhupada is saying, eat simply. That's important. Eat, of course, we have to eat, but eat simply. Don't be a king, eat a big feast all the time. Control the tongue. Okay, and uh, then, of, then when the other famous verse, which was in this section, is this one about Yashasti Bhaktir Bhagavat Yakinchina, famous verse, text number 12, that a devotee of the Lord has all the good qualities. So the question is raised, how to recognize who is actually a devotee and who is not a devotee? And Prabhupada says, he said, you can tell by the qualities, the qualities which they've manifest. One who is actually a devotee, a Vaishnava, he will have the good qualities. And the different qualities of a devotee are all listed there. So, very instructive point for, for devotees. We need to be conscious of everything. Okay. And all right, I think that, that was the other point, all the points covered. So, next one, we'll hear group number three from Ketumala, Varsha. Yes? Hare Krishna Maharaj. I'm Sugna Brenda here. Maharaj, in uh, Ketumala, we try to understand that this Ketumala Varsha, uh, the Lord in the form of Kamadev is residing with Lakshmi Devi. He stays here uh, to please Prajapati Samvatsara, who is son and daughter, are the controlling deities of the day and night respectively. So we try to understand here uh, in 15th verse and then in the 16th it says that Kamadev pleases Lakshmi, that is Rama. And uh, very beautifully it is explained Maharaj that uh, the beautiful face uh, the gracious moment, uh, the mild smile, moment of his eyebrows and playing glances, playful glances. Lord Kamade pleases Rama and enjoys the transcendental senses. In the text 17, we try to understand Lakshmi Devi is worshipping Kamadev. During the day, she is accompanied by Prajapati, that is Samvatsaka's son, and during the night, she accompanies by his daughters. Absorbed in devotional service, she chants. So this text 18, uh, the mantra, which uh, in detail we try to understand what is the text 18 saying that obeisance is paying obeisance to Lord Rishikesh. What is the meaning of Rishikesh? Rishikesh meaning is the controlling of the senses. So uh, to pay obeisance, that is respecting to the Lord, and in a various way because he is powerful he is the supplier of the strength of the senses and the body he is the supreme husband or master of all living entities he is the supplier of all necessities for the devotees uh, of whom five sense objects and 11 senses are partially manifested and then it says may he always be favorable towards us in this life and the next life and then in 19th verse, we try to understand material husbands are dependent, but women who worships, who worships Lord for a, as a husband to satisfy their senses are surely under illusion. That is Maya. So in uh, being in Maya, many, many uh, ways it is explained. If you give me a minute, I will just...
it is said jeeva goswami is explaining us uh, what is this maya maya that is very affectionate towards devotee but at the same time it is said by shilav vigraha aghava says this meaning is when one is very affectionate to an intimate relationship one is described as maya but shilav vishwanath chakravarti thakur explains maya uh, by dividing into two words maya and amaya he explains these words to indicate that because the living entity is covered by the disease of illusion the lord is always eager to deliver his devotee from the clutches of maya and cure him of the disease caused by the illusion and that's how we try to understand from text 20 a real has been is fearless that is lord only one who is never afraid but gives complete shelter to all fearful persons can actually become a husband and protector and that's the reason we say in uh, 580 5518 we say who can become a husband who can give to the dependent that is children and wife to the path of krishna consciousness and in 21 we try to understand motivated worship is discouraged so we try to understand what this means we can fulfill all the desires of women who worship your lotus feet if that worship is out of the pure love she receives all desired objects but if it is with material desire she attains only that result and in the end she becomes broken hearted and lamented uh, lamented now we also can understand here uh, that devahuti also she regretted last uh, when husband leaves her because she felt that why did i get into illusion why did i get into uh, because she could land up getting so many daughters and to take care and then only when she requested she could get uh, a husband as kapila who was lord himself and she gets enlightened so we understand here also the same if a woman is uh, serving with the desire of uh, material sense gratification then definitely uh, there is no success but if uh, husband and wife uh, the wife be chased and she is helping uh, herself also to be in devotion and uh, going on the path of husband if he is also devotee then that life is successful and that is what is rishikesha rishikesha that is we are taking keeping krishna in center trying control and doing devotion premamai aapko 22 23 bolna hai premamai premamai hari krishna satyam Uh, Jagan Prabhu, you can hear me. Yeah, I can hear you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, we can hear you. But uh, I think I. Master, Master, just call Master. Oh, okay. Then I will complete uh, uh, Maharaj twenty two twenty three also. In this, Lakshmi does not favor non devotee. To enjoy sense objects, Brahma, Shiva, and other demigods and demons perform severe austerity to receive. Uh, the benediction for the lord but i do not favor anyone unless they surrender to uh, the lord so this is very very clear here that uh, we say that lord is not partial but definitely one who surrenders lord favors there is no doubt about this and in 23rd also it says placing me it says you know placing me on your chest that is uh, god is a fortune you know it is addressed here please your worshipable lotus hand on my head lakshmi devi is saying like you do to your devotees although you bear my insignia of golden strength on your chest you show your real mercy to them and not to me who can understand your motivation that is you no know, uh, it is Lord, we say you know that uh, mother lakshmi is always there you know uh, and she resides on the chest that's what she is trying to say here actually 
Uh, my co-partner uh, was supposed to speak on this and have not read in detail about this marriage. Uh, if I have done any mistake, please correct me. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you, Maharaj. Maybe I was adding very fast, Maharaj, because others should get the chance, Maharaj. Well, no, we won't, we won't finish it today. We'll have to come, we'll continue it uh, in the next class. That will give the others some more time to prepare. Because it's, it's important, these prayers. There's yes. a lot of information yes. and we do have time. We're not rushed. We've got ten classes and so we do have time. So uh, we're not going to finish it tonight. But I would like to go over some of the points with you. Uh, it, you, you mentioned about the son and daughter, right? Yes, sir. Remember? Yes. So there's how many of them? How many children? How many children? There are many. I'll... Give me a minute, my dear. The Prajapati, right? He was a Prajapati. So he had a lot yes, of children. Yeah, he had a lot yes, of children. And the sons represent the day and the daughters the night. Maharaj, the number, the number count is given, uh, if I'm not wrong. It says um, they are, they are uh, 36,000. Yes, right. 36,000. Do you know why? It's, yes. <laughs> do you know why 36,000? Do you know how... No, marriage you enlighten us, please. Yes, because one for each day in the life of a person. The average, oh, you know, a person lives 100 years and 360 okay. days in a year. So, 36,000. <laughs> oh, Krishna. <laughs> right? That was... One day, one child for each day in the life of a person. <laughs> Too much. Hare Krishna. Right? And yes. I, I wanted to look a bit more also at text number uh, 22, which as you said, you, you, didn't, you, you weren't really prepared for that. But there's an important point in it, in the purport Prabhupada brings up. That, okay. Uh, he says, uh, Lakshmi clearly states that she doesn't give her favor to any materialistic person. So, we may wonder how is it so many materialistic people have got, it seems like they've got the blessings of Lakshmi. You know, they, they seem quite materialistic, they're not devotees, they're not really pious, but somehow they've got the blessings, it seems like they've got the blessings of Lakshmi. But Lakshmi herself declares in this text, she doesn't give the blessings to materialistic people. So who gives them them? Who gives the blessing? They say, that's coming from Goddess Durga, a material expansion of Lakshmi. Mother Durga gives her blessings. Those who desire material wealth worship Durga. And Prabhupada gives a prayer how they worship Mother Durga. <laughs> Danam Dehi, Rupam Dehi, Rupavati, Baryam Dehi. <laughs> Please give me, give me wealth, give me strength, fame, good wife. Pleasing Goddess Durga, you can get it. But it's only Maya Sukh. It's not eternal happiness. <clears throat> when Prabhupada writes, when a devotee acquires, when a devotee acquires unparalleled opulences, they are the direct gifts of the goddess of fortune, who resides in the heart of Narayan. So sometimes devotees are blessed with opulence, just like. Rupa Goswami, he got, somebody came to help him build the Govinda temple. Sanatana Goswami got help to build Madan Mohan temple. And Prabhupada was blessed. People like George Harrison donated the Bhaktivedanta Manor. And then Alfred Ford helped him 
to purchase a temple in Detroit and also in Hawaii and he's helping build the temple of the Vedic planetarium. Those are different places. Prabhupada was poor, he had nothing, but Krishna gave. And then Prabhupada writes a very important quote in the purport and he talks about how, he says, sometimes devotees, they go to the spiritual master and they want to get, uh, they want to get the property of the spiritual master, right? They want to enjoy the, the spiritual master's property. And Prabhupada said, we've actually seen one of the disciples, he wanted to enjoy the property of his spiritual master. And the spiritual master, being merciful to him, gave him the temporary property. He gave him the property, but he did not give him the power to preach the holy name all over the world. He didn't give that. He gave him the bricks and the cement. He gave him the land, but he, give, he didn't give him the mercy, the power, which was the Krishna Shakti, which was needed for preaching. And Prabhupada said, that special mercy of the power to preach is given to a devotee who does not want anything material from his spiritual master, but wants only to serve him. So this is a very important point. And then Prabhupada gives the example about Ravan, how Ravan tried to take Sita from Lord Ram. He wanted to enjoy Mother Sita. And look what happened to Ravan. Look how he, he and all of his uh, family, they were all vanquished. Oh, so that's, uh, I thought it's a very powerful purport there. And then text 23 also goes on, uh, because Lakshmi was saying that, uh, that you show your real mercy to your devotees, not to me. Lakshmi didn't get the real mercy of the Lord. And Prabhupada brings up the point how Mother Lakshmi didn't get to join Rasa Leela. Although she wanted to join Rasa Leela, she didn't get that opportunity to go into Rasa Leela. And Prabhupada quotes in the purport quite extensively how Lord Chaitanya was talking with, Ram, uh, with uh, Va Venkata Bhatta in Sri Rangam, because Venkata Bhatta, he's a Ramanuja Vaishnava, and they worship Lakshmi as the goddess of fortune, and they say Krishna, Laksh Krishna and Vishnu are the same, and they say, Lakshmi, what about Mother Lakshmi? So Lord Chaitanya was telling how he said that she wanted to dance Rasa Leela, but she couldn't. And even she went to Vrindavan and did austerity for a long time and asked the Brijbasi people to bless her. But still she couldn't become a gopi because she couldn't give up her queenly opulences. But the Shruti Charas, the Shruti Charas, they came and they had the blessings to go to join Rasa Leela, but to, in order to do that, they had to first take birth in the family of gopis. They had to become gopis themselves before they could actually join Rasa Leela. So uh, this point comes up. Lakshmi, she's saying she couldn't get the mercy of the Lord, but he, get, he, get, he does give the mercy to his greatest devotees, the gopis. And you want to get Krishna's mercy, you have to follow the gopis. And that's what Lord Chaitanya is teaching everyone, follow in the footsteps of the gopis of Vrindavan. Okay, so we'll stop here today. It's already time up. And if there's any questions, I could take them. Otherwise, we'll save them for next class. Yes. If you permit me, just uh, you are asking the higher Krishna and higher Griva. Uh -huh. that, uh, both are the same, Maharaj. Both are yeah. same, are they? Yeah. I thought that. I wondered yeah. about that. Thank yeah. you so much. I was, yeah, I was, I was wondering why suddenly the reading came in six uh, shloka. So it stated that uh, this when Lord Brahma 
it factors not appeared in the form of high fever with hot spaces or uh, space body and he killed the madhu kaitaba and he just to the veda okay very good yes thank you very much very nice hare of you man hare krishna okay thank you very much so we'll meet on tuesday night and those of you who didn't prepare we'll continue with that in the next class thank you shrila prabhupad ki hi uh, hi this only is bhakti vigna